Okay, I have turned on the record. So, many of you have heard of the Jan Kindler collection at this point. Uh, it came to us, the France and Colonies Society, about, uh, uh, we got notice of it last, late last year sometime, and in uh, early 2023, Jerry Dutt, one of our trustees and corresponding secretary, and I went out to Manhattan and brought back what had been donated to us. Today, we're going to see the, the postal stationary piece of this. Uh, Jan collected the sower stamp of 1906 to 1921, and this was the result of it. Now I have to make this thing go forward. And my little button, oh, there's my little buttons. There we go. As, you, as I said, now it gets brighter. So the first, the table of contents, what we're going to talk about today are Jan himself, a little background. Then I'll tackle the sewer stationery in this order, the letter cards, postal cards, so on. Finally, getting to Memel and a postcard at the very end issued by the French equivalent of the Postal Stationery Society. And uh, I just wanted to note here that this is all Jan's information. And while I don't know that anything is more, uh, that there's any new information to share about the Red Sower Stationery, uh, whatever we do see here is his work. So Jan, um, I think you will still continue to see, you still see what I was showing, right? Um, yes. He had, he was born in 1920, died in 1998. His parents were pretty well known. His, his father, Hans Kindler, is in Wikipedia. So is his mother, Alice Riddle Kindler, but he's, he founded, Hans founded the National Symphony Orchestra in Washington, D.C. Um, Alice was an artist, and one of her murals ended up being displayed in the Ware Shoals, South Carolina post office, uh, probably during the Depression when the post office was keeping starving artists alive, paying, paying them for these murals. Uh, Jan himself apparently had a pretty interesting life, but... To our knowledge, he didn't have a definitive career. He was a, a writer, and we can see, for example, that uh, his his uh, articles appeared at least one in Playboy that he wrote about W.C. Fields. If you go on uh, HTTPS, hold on, people are coming in here. Uh, let me make you small again. Sorry. Um, archive.org, you'll find references to Kindler that relate to theat theatrical and radio productions and so on. So he was apparently a pretty interesting guy and did not have to uh, work regularly as far as we know. He married, he had no children, and he was a collector of many things. Stamps, postcards, playing cards, um, jazz music, limericks. He belonged to many of the collector organizations uh, that related to his interests. So he was part of the Cinderella Society. Um, he was part of the France and Colonies Philatelic Society from 1956 to 1988, I believe. So he was a student of, of uh, the sower stamps and related items. He was a New York City resident for many, many years, although he had siblings in Europe. His mother moved back to Europe and uh, lived out the rest of her life there, dying in 1980, give or take. And uh, Jan went back and visited his siblings quite frequently, frequently and his mother. So that's Jan. And uh, the picture was taken now 12 plus 23, 35 years ago. And that's what he looked like when he would have been 68 years old. Here we are in his, what I assume was an exhibit. It's in one of the Springback uh, Elbe 
albums on uh, national pages, national stamp album pages with the little curlicues up in the corners. Uh, this is clearly hand drawn and he did not spell stationary right, but you know what? We'll certainly forgive him for that at this point. He claims that this is a complete collection of the postal stationery. We go to the letter card. First. And it's a little hard to see here, but on the page of the 1906 printing, he has these four cards, and they are slightly different shades of, of paper. It's really hard to tell, but they are also four different control numbers. And my understanding of the control numbers is that the six is the year and the two following digits are the week of the year that these items were printed. So 36, 37, 48, 47th week of 1906 are when these parts were actually printed. Classic letter card perforated. We've, we've all seen these if we have any uh, French postal stationery at all. There are a few varieties, including one from the 1906 printing that he considered that he said was unlisted, and I don't know that that has changed. 49 is upside down on the card, and that is in his collection as well. In 1907, the card was was redrawn, is how I would describe this. You can see the lettering is thicker at the top, also on the sides, the word postus. Uh, and if you look at the, the sewer herself, the lettering or the there are some differences in the way her dress, her face, the Liberty cap are drawn. So all of that happened between 1906 and 1907, in addition to there being new control numbers for the 1907 printings. But this is probably the best place to see the design differences. In 1907, they're also printed on different colored paper. Um, and if my understanding of the control numbers is correct, we have here cards printed in 1908, 9, and 1914. But I'm not, again, I'd be happy to have somebody explain that more thoroughly to me. Um, but it's entirely possible that that indeed is when these cards were made. There are listed varieties of this, the 819 inverted on a letter card, and the 817 in the lower card is a larger numeral, more elongated than, uh, than all the other numerals, control numbers that were printed on these cards. In addition, he turned up a printed uh, form letter, if you will, that a uh, Daras in in Daras Brothers in Paris had pre-printed that they used when they were telling their customers what was happening with their order. And in this case, the, the form is printed. They typed in some additional information like the customer name and so on and the date. And in the middle there, it tells us that uh, they shipped, they shipped the guy's order. Um, but this Pepto Kina Vintra show is not included because they don't know what it is. And if the customer so desires, they will do some more research and try and send them the balance of the order. Well, this was such a cool thing that businessmen were using, business people were using the cards in that way that they then printed in uh, supposedly in 1907. I can't, I don't remember the control number on this one. Let me look. Uh, the control number is 924. They printed them without perforations. And as you can see, it still says it's at the bottom, please uh, open this letter card using the perforations, but there aren't any. And the idea was that it was easier to put these through a typewriter than it was if you had the had to worry about tearing the perforations on the letter cards as they had previously been prepared. It still has the gum around the edges, so it was still in the, the area that you could use inside the letter card was still the same. And the, the uh, 
part would then be folded in half, licked shut, and sent on its merry way. So that is the end of the letter cards. And from there, we go to the postal cards. Now, again, we have 1906, uh, 1907 printings, control numbers, rather. Uh, the early cards all have the thin lettering that you see. Um, he claims that the card numbers uh, 646, the one at the top that you see with the German cancel on it, is from the first date of printing, the 46th week of 1906, and the bottom card is the last date of printing, the 27th week of 1907. And I don't know if that's true or not, but Jan studied things pretty clearly or pretty thoroughly. So let's assume that he was right about that. Excuse me, I have somebody else who is asking to join us. We have... Um, Cards that were now redrawn, they had the heavy lettering. There are several paper and inks that were used on these cards, uh, and they were printed over a long, long period of time. Think about the red sower as more or less equivalent to our two-cent Washington from the Washington Franklin series, which was in use at the same time. This was a, a workhorse stamp and color for the French, and there are a heck of a lot of them available, uh, generally pretty common in the philatelic marketplace. But that also meant for collectible varieties, just like our Washington Franklins, which you can make a whole career out of studying. Um, the type one cards are on blue-green paper, which is the top one, and the uh, shades, which you see like in the second card there, are not differentiated in the catalog. The uh, lower card says 1908 based on the control number and the upper card 1909. But they're clearly the redrawn so on. These two cards are shown on the same page. This is uh, the type 2 on a dark green paper and then on uh, wartime paper, uh, the, the type three card. So these were printed from 1914 to 1920, uh, soft yellow paper, very crappy because of wartime. Um, like most of their stationery and a lot of their stamps too. <laughs> Postal cards were overprinted by hand. This was uh, done to use as instructional material in the postal school. They are all printed in the eighth week of 1911. They all have the 108 control number. But because these were hand stamps, uh, there, there are variations in how they were printed. You can see the pressure applied on the right side of the bottom right stamp and the crooked one in the middle. Uh, just pretty typical of what the uh, any hand stamp would would uh, look like, and they are not separately cataloged because they were just done that way. So those are the postal cards. And then from there, we go to reply cards. There's only one type of the reply card. Uh, they're inscribed in French. The attached card is for the response. Uh, there are no control numerals on this card. There are some varieties, which you see here. Uh, he's noted these in, in his collection that um, the bottom card has the dot over the word destiné missing. And the top, uh, actually the two bottom ones, both cards rather, and the top card has a missing uh, accent mark over the letter E. Whether or not those are major varieties, I don't know. So 1914 and 1919, these cards were reprinted. 
uh, the, the control numbers match on the destination card and the reply card. And there are the same differences in wartime paper where you see the crummier yellowish paper on the, the uh, card printed in 1924 or on uh, 1919, I'm sorry, week 24. There are also some printed in 1915. Yeah, I took a picture of that. Uh, there are, are uh, different dates on the destination card and the reply card. One printed in week 37, one in week 43, if our interpretation of these control numbers is correct. And uh, there's no message on the outbound card, which is typical of all of them, that says the attached card is for a response. Most of you know that the a reply card is supposed to come back by itself without that the, the recipient of the destination card is supposed to tear the two in half and send only the response card back. In the U.S., the same is true. And if you read the rules officially, uh, if the response is still attached to the outbound card, you're supposed to treat it as a first-class letter. And in our case today, pay 63 cents instead of 48 cents, the postcard rate, to mail it back. Uh, which I find very interesting because I send out reply cards every month and I get three or four of them that are still attached to the outbound card and nobody ever has... Uh, assessed postage due on those when they come back to me. Although, interestingly enough, the post office has several times argued with the recipient saying that the outbound card with the reply card attached is supposed to be go is supposed to go at 63 cents and not at the postcard rate. And it's pretty clear according to the rules that they should. All right. So we have the two different control numbers on these reply cards. And that's the last of the unusual reply cards. So the next thing we have is envelopes. These were first printed in 1907, not 1906. There's an inscription at the upper left, as you can see, sent by in the room for name and address and so on. There are two sizes of these envelopes and two shades. Uh, a light green and a dark green. And the bottom one is a uh, greenish color. Uh, there are, like I said, there's two sizes. The smaller envelope, which is, I think, what we have here. I don't remember. I, I have a, the album in front of me, and I don't see what size these are. Or 125 by 93, the larger one, which you will see soon, is a 147 by one. So, uh, there are control numbers on these envelopes as well, and those vary, the 730 and the 924. Here's type 2, which is a white paper, and it's clearly white. There's a con different control number on the back, and the interior is blue-green, which you'll see in a moment. So... The small size envelope has no, in, this has no inscription on it, rather than the return address inscription. It does have a control number, and I've shown it inverted because that, that way it's looking right side up to us, 016, which tells us it should have been printed in 1910. Uh, and it falls right under where the flap would cover it up if you uh, lick the envelope shut. These are two listed types, one and one A. Type one has a uh, clear gum. You can see the greenish interior or blue green interior. And type one A had a blackish gum, um, cream color, cream colored paper rather than white. And uh, like in the US, the difference between white and cream is kind of hard to tell it now a hundred years later. Uh, but the control numbers help you keep them apart. Here's the larger size. This is a, uh, they call it a greenish paper, but to me, it doesn't have very much of a sh greenish shade to it. 
It has clear gum. The interior is blank. It's not uh, blue-green. And it's available both with and without a control number. This one has a 727 control number. The uh, return address indicium is up in the upper left again. Here's uh, clear gum, again, plain, and did I change that? No, there we go. Here, uh, this one has the blue-green interior. Now it has a control number 210, which according to our Higgins and Gage catalog was printed in 1908, but the control number would indicate it was printed in 1912. So I don't know if that means I don't understand the control numbers correctly or if Higgins and Gage didn't understand for sure when they were printed. I just don't know. Here's a uh, cream paper. There's no inscription again for return address again. Uh, these are with and without a control number. And uh, the control number in this case is 640, indicating it was printed in 1916. Now, that's the end of the of the envelopes. And in addition to these, the postcards were overprinted and surcharged for use in memo, which uh, was in north northern Poland, if I remember right. Somebody will correct me if I've said that wrong. Um, these were. Uh, printed with a new control number, 1919, week 41. There's only one control number, but as you can see, they printed it on both the older paper that was truly greenish and the newer crappy wartime paper, which is the darker one down below, surcharged in German currency, Fennigs rather than, um, than centimes. And, uh, this area was, as I note here, it was um, administered by the French after World War I. They intended to have a plebiscite, I believe, to decide whether they were going to join Poland or Latvia or remain independent. And in 1923, the Latvians took it over and settled the issue without an election. The last piece I have is a commemorative card that was printed by ACEP. You can see the uh, collectors of postal stationery. And uh, this was much newer because the postcard rate is now 40 centimes. 1934, I believe, is, yeah, is the date. But on the card itself, they uh, included an image of the 10 cent sewer letter card, which I thought was very nice, and Jan included that in his collection. So that is all I have in his sewer stationary collection. Before I, I turn this over to everybody else uh, for commentary, I will, uh, I, I apologize for not uh, muting everybody. I should have done that. Um, I will comment that Ed, in his discussions with Jan, who knew Jan back in, as he says, 50 years ago or thereabouts, um, Jan said that it, he had dropped some self-addressed postcards from the top of the Eiffel Tower, and uh, he had at least one of them returned to him, but... I have looked and looked and looked, and I have not found any of those in the sewer material that came to us. Not that we're going to stop looking, but uh, at this point, we just don't don't know what happened to the card that allegedly came back to him. If we find it, I can assure you we'll scan it and put it on the website. Now, I will also say that, uh, let me stop this share. We have posted a bunch of Jan's collection on our website. And one of the fun things that we ran into when we were going through all of this was 
this letter. And if you look up help on the web, it tells you that help was a magazine published briefly in the 19 late 50s and 1960s. The publisher was a guy, and I've forgotten his name now, I'm sorry to say, who came out of the Mad Magazine staff, and all of us in the United States certainly remember Mad Magazine, addressed to Jan, but most interesting is, look who signed that. She was a secretary at Help Magazine in 1960, and indeed the the Wikipedia website lists her as a secretary at that time, or lists her as one of the staff people at that time. So this is one of the cool things that's in his collection. This is one that uh, we're going to pull out and we hope auction separately and actually get 10 bucks for it instead of throwing it into a bunch of of, uh, miscellaneous floor sweepings, if you will, when we auction his collection. So now I'm done with the program and we'll open it to questions and comments. And remember that I, most of us are muted. So unmute yourself if you want to say something, please. Ken. Yes. I have a copy of Storch and Franzone's uh, catalog of um, Postal Stationery. This dates from 1978. And it does list the inverted date number on the letter card. So that was listed. And at that time, it has just a very small premium over the normal card. Normal card is listed at 10 francs. And the reverse date is listed at 12 francs, which would imply that it was fairly common. They made a lot of them. Yep. It must have been in a separate printing from the indicium and the rest of the card in order to for it to have been inverted. Uh, do you think, or could they have just put the slug in? Up oh, there? yeah, that makes more sense. The slug would be inserted backwards when somebody replaced the slug. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Anybody else? Uh, uh, Ken, just uh, a couple of things. Uh, did you check uh, the... Uh, meeting notes in the in the philatelist uh, for Jan's period to see if there were any summaries of uh, of his presentations. I did not. Okay, I, I mean, I I joined in seventy two, and at that time we 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 did uh, um, fairly elaborate summaries. You know, like a whole page summary of of a meeting, and I I did it for quite a while. I can't remember how many years and used to put a lot of effort into it. And uh, I'm just wondering if there'd be additional Kindler information or information about the collection uh, uh, when he spoke. Uh, but, you know, you'd have to dig dig that out. Yes. The uh, good news is that because it's available electronically, we could get at that more easily than reading every issue. Yeah. Uh, did, when you uh, put put this together, did you use both uh, uh, the French Postal Stationery Catalog and Higgins, Higgins and Gage or just one of them? I used no catalog. I okay. simply scanned what he had in his collection. Okay. And I don't know if this will show up at all, but this is this is the first page, and it it looks like an exhibit page. Um, and you can see the national Scott National album page border around the edges, which is what he used. Yeah, I mean, he put it up in the frames at the Collectors Club mm-hmm. uh, the way we did it in those days. Yep.
I, I also have a, a, a question relating to group type, and I'm happy to see Loic is here. He he may be able to answer it, or uh, maybe Bruno. I I see his name is on the uh, chart too. There are a couple of group type pieces of postal stationery that have control numbers on them. Uh, uh, are those control numbers used the same way where the first digit is the year of printing and the second two are the, are the week of printing? Do you know anything about that, Loic? That's a great question. I mean, I was looking online right now, and so I, I know that for the for the software stationery, that seems to be, you know, the, the common understanding because for the for the 25 centim blue that is defined the same so for the first digit is the year and the second the, the second and third digit are the week i would say it's probably you know it's not a big jump to say hey that might be the same for because what we have numbers like what 047 or 046 so that would be the end, i remember yeah the end of 1900 uh, that seems kind of right for when, you know, some of those like 10 cents, you know, red or, or 25 cents blue were, uh, were coming out. Uh, yeah, that might be logical. And that's, a, that's, like, that's indeed an interesting little item to, to research. Well, I'll, yeah. leave that, I'll leave that to you. And it's another stand that has been engraved by Mouchon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Loic has sent us a link to uh, the ACEP site. Is that what we're looking at? I'm not sure if it's from from ASAP or or not, but it's, it's a a nice nice site about the the 25 centim, you know, blue sewer with a, I think with a uh, okay, me, yeah. Um, it's relatively well well made. It's much better than the antipostal.fr that's that has not been maintained for like 15 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's very nice looking. All right. Anybody else got something they want to talk about? So for those of you who have like uh, some money to spend and have a uh, passion for the group type stamps, there is some very expensive <laughs> overprint from the French office in Indochina on the 75 cent with the inverted Indochine uh, that are for sale by what, Siegel, I think, auctions. Yes. Uh, it's out of my price range. <laughs> so go for it. <laughs> There seem to be a lot of it, though. Oh, they have like six, six of them. So you have the the Canton and block of nine. There is a, another block from Pacoy. There is a couple of from Montse. There, yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Most of them probably unique or or extremely rare, uh, but it's all at you know they kind of expect to get like ten thousand, twenty five thousand, thirty thousand. So, yeah. Is that in a current catalog, uh, Loic? You can you can look at it on on uh, Phila Search. Let me let me get oh, it. Okay, Phila Search. It's it's under Siegel. Yeah. Okay. I want to say it's in their Rarities of the World sale. Is that sound the right? Magnolia, the Magnolia collection. Yes, Magnolia. Okay. But it's but it's no postal history, is there? No, just stamps. Mm -hmm. I can share it. Uh, and uh, Chris Dustin shared a uh, an eBay auction of a handwritten postcard by Gloria Steinem showing an estimate of $45. So, or I don't know if that was an auction item or if it's a buy it now, but. Yeah, but you're, the one we have has, has a mad tie-in, right? It does. Well, that, you know, what <laughs> worry? Uh, nobody knows where that comes from, except me. 